You guys awake? I see some old faces, some faces. I'm just excited to see y'all. Hello. Like how we just point people out when I'm up here. It's dangerous letting me have a mic. Um, last week we discussed some pretty heavy stuff, didn't we? What the cross really means for us. How many of you, at the end of that service, you thought, okay, I, I need to hear that. It was a lot of information. It's almost like, it's almost like a bass. Okay, nice. I feel like I'm beatboxing without the talent. Uh, yes, now I know where I'm going. If you feel like maybe uh, you needed to, uh, you need a little more information, or maybe you just need to grapple with this idea, after service, we're going to bring some tables up here, and we're just going to sit around these tables, and we're going to discuss this really heavy concept of the cross. So if you'd like to join us, please come on, come on over afterwards, grab a table, sit around it. And we're going to take about 10 to 15 minutes and just discuss what does the cross really mean for us. If you had any questions from that teaching, there's your chance to, to take it. What do you think? You going to do it? Amen. Good. I hope to see some of you afterwards. Um, I had some people talk to me about, uh, wow, this brought up a lot of questions about what the Bible is. And so let me quickly, because you're so used to me playing it safe, let me, let me just quickly... Uh, Describe to you what I see when I read the Bible and what I, what I see that the Bible is not. So let me, let me say this. The Bible, the Bible is not basic instructions before leaving earth. That used to be really popular like 10 years ago. We even had songs about it. The Bible is not an owner's manual that helps you become perfect. That wasn't the point of the Bible. And some people read it this way. I can't wait till I get out of here so I can just go to heaven. I'll become perfect, then I'll go to heaven. Is that the whole reason for the story of the Bible? If it's your reason, this life means very little. Another idea that people have is this. The Bible's a history book. It's his story. You've heard this before, right? Ignore Steve touching my butt. <laughs> now you can't help but notice. Uh, the Bible is a history book. And so a lot of people will read the Bible accordingly. They'll look at all the dates and they'll say, look, ooh, that was a nice transition. They'll, they'll look at the Bible and say, it's just a history book. Got all the dates. We're back. There we go. All right, here we go. And so the, the Bible is just a big history book. And they'll try to make the dates fit. But unfortunately, the Bible, when you look at it, you'll read like Kings, and then you'll read Chronicles, and you'll find out that the Bible doesn't know, the authors don't always agree. And that can be frustrating if you're trying to make it fit into your own timelines. I know people that pull out the decoder rings, and they'll pull out their graphs, and they'll try to figure it out. The Bible was not intended to be for that use. Here's what the Bible is. The Bible is God allowing his people to tell the story. Did y'all hear me? God allows his people to tell the story. And this is what happens. God says, hey, isn't our journey great? And they say yes or no, dependent on where they are. And they get to a place where they begin writing their stories, looking back at the past, and they bring it to the present. And they say, how do we find meaning in the present now so that we have hope for the future? kind of like we do often with the Bible today. Do you guys get it? The Bible is God allowing his people to tell the story. And so what's the story? What's the story? For some of you, the story is fear God and pray that he doesn't burn you at the end. Is that a hopeful story? Some of you, the story is, hey, you're really sinful and messed up. You better get your act together. Is that the story? Because I think somewhere along the line, someone hijacked our story. Here's the story. In Genesis, we were deceived. In Genesis, we were deceived. God said, hey, I have this beautiful template of how to live. Here's what I look like. Do you want to follow this? And you know what? For many of us, it looked good until we, were, we saw the fruit. Um, 
we're just struggling today with this stuff. It's toying with me. So in Genesis, we were deceived. We believed that there was life apart from God. And we started to go the wrong direction. And we bought into systems of violence and chaos, oppression. And God the whole time saying, whoa, 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 that's not the way to live. It's like we put on these glasses that had really foggy lenses. You ever have that happen? You put on your sunglasses and you're like, whoa, I can't see. You almost run off the road. They're so foggy and dirty. You got to wipe them. And this is what God does. He sees that we have these glasses on. They're distorting our perception of who he is, who we are together. And he steps in. And he says, look, you don't have to live that way. There's a different way to live. There's a different system. And so Jesus Christ, he steps into our systems of violence, oppression, greed. And he says, look at a different way to live. Amen? A different system. And at the cross, that whole system of greed, that beastly way of living, totally destroyed. Amen? Totally destroyed. That is the way I choose to perceive the Bible, how I choose to read it. And I hope that we as a church can begin kind of following this pattern that is more redemptive than it is scary. Do you guys get it? So, when we read the books of Daniel and Revelation, I need you to understand we may not pull out our decoder rings every time. I may not stand up. I actually will never stand up with a big graph. What I want to show us is this, these, we're dealing with systems. What system do you buy into? You guys okay with that? I told you we're not going to play it safe. So pray with me before we begin. Lord, I just want to thank you, praise you that you brought us here tonight, this morning. It feels like a night. <laughs> Lord, we just want to thank you that you're good, that at the cross you reveal to us who you are. And Lord, we thank you that we have the opportunity to just dig through this book of Daniel. Thank you, Lord, in your name we pray, amen. I'm going to try to, try to move quickly, so uh, if I'm moving fast, just raise your hand, be like, slow down. Can you do that? I don't think anyone will, but if you do, I'll be very impressed. It takes a lot of bravery. So here we go. Daniel, chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. It was the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede, the son of Ahasuerus, who became king of the Babylonians. During the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, learned from the reading of the word of the Lord as revealed to Jeremiah the prophet that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. So again, here's the background. Jeremiah and his people, 587 AD, or BC, they go into exile. The Babylonians come in, totally destroy them. And they bring the remaining people into Babylon. And God's people are stuck there. And God's people are saying, how long? How long are we going to be stuck in exile? And most of them believe it's going to be a very short time. Jeremiah steps in and says this, yeah, how about that? Don't you love it when people say that? Yeah, about that. You know something interesting is coming. About that, it's going to be more like 70 years. And so Daniel here in verses 1 and 2, he's kind of reminding God. He's kind of pushing him. He's saying, God, remember that promise that you made us 65 years ago that uh, you were going to step in and free us? Uh, are you still going to do it? We've been really good. So Daniel reminds God, God, remember this promise. And so then we move into chapter 9, verses uh, 17, 18, and 19. I think this is funny. How many of you ever said these prayers when you want God to do something? You begin to say these beautiful, like, flowery prayers. Oh, Lord God, my Father, loving Father. And you start trying to add as many adjectives as you can because you think maybe if you, you, you flower it up enough, he'll answer your prayer. Anyone ever do that? I see it all the time when people stand up to do, like, public prayers. It's weird that we get nervous during public prayers, isn't it? It's weird. We're a weird group. And so Daniel, he's trying to, he's trying to work over God. And look what he says here. Oh, our God, hear your servant's prayer. Listen as I plead for your own sake. I like that. For your sake, Lord, not mine, of course. For your sake, I need that beamer. 
I could bless you in so many ways in a faster car. For your sake, Lord, smile again on your desolate sanctuary. Oh, my God, lead down and listen to me. Open your eyes and see our despair. See how your city, the city that bears your name, by the way, bears your name, lies in ruins. We make this plea not because we deserve help, but because of your mercy. And he continues on reminding God, you should probably answer your prayer, our prayers. It's been 65 years. Daniel is expecting something big to happen in five. And look what happens. Daniel gets a visit. He gets a visit in chapter 9, verse 24, 22, 21. How many of you have ever been visited by an angel? I've always thought this would be great. And I've always wondered, why does an angel not visit me? Until I read this passage and I thought, no, this would probably be the angel that visits me. Because watch what happens. Daniel, he's praying to God, please, please fulfill this prophecy. Don't forget us. And the, and, the, and the angel comes to him. He says this. As I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen in earlier vision, came swiftly to me at the time of the evening sacrifice. He explained to me, Daniel, I've come here to give you insight and understanding. The moment you began to pray, I love that. The very moment you began to pray, I com a command was given. And now I am here to tell you what it was. For you are very precious to the Lord. Everyone say that. You are precious to the Lord. You are deeply loved. You need to know that. Listen carefully so that you understand the meaning of your vision. And here was what it is. A period of 70 sets of seven has been declared for you and your people in the holy city to finish their rebellion, put an end to their sin, atone for their guilt, to bring everlasting righteousness, to confirm the prophetic vision, and to anoint the most holy place. If I'm Daniel... I'm really torqued right now. How many of you have ever waited for something and waited for something and it didn't come when you expected it? Is that frustrating? Daniel, 65 years. I can imagine he's packing his bags. He's got boxes out. He's ready to move. And then this angel steps in. He's like, oh, uh, <laughs> about that 70 it's actually going to be more like 70 times 7. And Daniel, if you're bad at math like me, he's like, S that's like 480? No, Daniel, 90. 490? That's a lot of years. Yeah. You're going to be in exile a lot longer. Mm. This is painful. I might say this. Are you sure you're an angel? I'd want to see the angel's ID card. Yeah, I'd be like, who's your manager? Take me to him. You don't seem like an angel. You seem more like a demon. That's not good news. 490 years? More? That's not good news. And Daniel, you can just imagine he's just heartbroken. 490. This idea is 70 times 7. Should seem familiar to some of you. 70 times 7. 7 is always this word, this, uh, this idea of it's completion. So watch this. We see seven over and over again in the Bible. Genesis 4. What happens to Cain? God puts his mark and he says what? You mess with Cain, what happens to you? You messing with me? Seven times I'll pay you back. That's serious. And then Lamech, he, generations later, he says, hey, you mess with me? I'll pay you back 70 times seven. And you get this escalation of violence until you get to the flood. It just escalates worse and worse and worse and worse. When you buy into this system of greed, oppression, anger, violence, it continues to escalate until what? You experience a death to its fullest. Jesus, on the other hand, brings up 77, doesn't he? Interesting. The disciples come to him and they say, hey, Jesus, how many times do we forgive? Seven? Jesus there. We've got a picture of him. Jesus there. It was taken. It was really neat. I don't, someone had an iPhone. They were ready to capture it. And there, beautiful. Jesus says, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, 
actually, you will forgive them 70 times seven. And he begins an escalation that goes this way, an escalation of grace and love and forgiveness, a very different kind of system. When you are in conflict with people, which way do you escalate? Do you start to go this way, and you start scheming their demise? I'll ruin you. You're going to find a paper clip on your, on your seat and point it up. Or are you going to be going this way, showing love and grace and forgiveness? Which direction do you choose? Another interesting thing that gets brought up here in Daniel, I think it's funny. Whenever I get online, there's some crazies online, by the way. Crazies, and they terrify me. Chapter in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. The ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one set of sevens, but after half this time, he'll be put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. And as a climax to all these terrible deeds, he'll set up a sacrilegious object that causes desecration until the fate of the decreed for this, uh, I can't even read that, yep, is finally poured out on him. I want you to think about this. When you go online and you start looking at people who are attempting to decode Scripture, you can end up in some very weird places. What is this abomination of desecration? What is it? I think these pictures are great. We try to get people to come to our church by sending them this stuff. Come to our church. We're loving people. We need to change that soon. And so, this abomination, I need to teach you a little history lesson. Can I give you guys just a five-minute history lesson? It's really good. Okay, good. Let me show you. Next slide. Uh, Daniel is set in the 6th century B.C. That's 500s. It's set during this time period, but it's written in 2nd century. 100s. So, what happens in between here is very important for us. What happens is during the 4th century B.C., there's a guy that steps into the scene. His daddy... He was a chieftain. He wasn't, wasn't super big, didn't have a lot of power. But his dad, he begins to raise this boy named Alexander. And Alexander, <coughs> he begins to grow in wisdom. In fact, uh, he goes, actually school comes to him. I don't know how many of you have ever been in these conversations with people. Which school did you go to? I went to Harvard. Yale. Princeton. He would, have, he would have said this. Oh, uh, Aristotle, you know the guy that you're reading about? He was my tutor. School came to me, fool. My teacher was school. <laughs> had a one-upper. And so what he does is at 21, his father dies, and he begins this mass movement of just taking over everything from Greece to India, the known world taking over everything. And in Daniel 8, it's, we're, we're, we're told there's this, this goat, and it's running super fast. And it's taking over everything. This is Alexander the Great. And at 33, he dies. 33, Alexander the Great dies. Not so great. He dies early. He did not have a successor for his time. And so his kingdom is broken up into four kingdoms. And it's called the Seleucid Empire. And what happens here with the Seleucid Empire is this. Four different generals, they begin to take charge. What happens next is interesting. Because 150 years after Alexander the Great, 100 years before Jesus steps onto the scene, we have someone that steps in and he's terrifying. Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Isn't that a great name to be called? What's your name? Tony Werfel. What's your name? Antiochus Epiphanes. The fourth. I want a different name. So Antiochus steps onto the scene, and he says, hey, everyone needs to be Greek. You need to eat Greek, talk Greek. You need to have a big, fat Greek wedding. Greek. Everything is Greek. And so he begins to move everyone toward Greek, 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 Greek. The Jewish nation, they say, we don't buy this. We won't eat from this table. They don't listen. And there becomes this big divide between them and the Greeks. And 
Antiochus gets frustrated, and he begins to really push them, taking away their festivals, doing all these things, until finally he does one thing that they, the Hebrews consider the worst possible thing you could do. This was desecration to the nth degree. He steps into their, their, their uh, temple, and he puts a big statue of Zeus. That's bad, isn't it? That's really bad. That'd be like someone coming in here and putting a big statue of Satan. Would you be offended? Gee, I'd be a little offended. Get that crap out of here. I'd be mad. Zeus, right in the middle. And then what they do is even worse. They sacrifice bacon. Take a pig. And they sacrifice it right there in the temple. This is an abomination, a desecration. And this is what happens. And God's people are outraged. How dare he do this? Jesus on the Mount of Olives, he'll say, hey, you thought that's bad. Watch, there's another time coming. 70 AD shows up. He, he, he speaks of it very precisely. And you see the temple totally destroyed. So these two concepts are there in the Bible, and I think it's important we understand them from the perspective of the people at that time. Did you all hear that? Understanding that time period will help us understand how to relate it to our present that's how we view Daniel and Revelation. Turn with me, Daniel chapter 12, verse 13. As for you, I like how I say that and no one does it. <laughs> it's like, why would I have this? I have it right up there. As for you, go your way until the end. The what? The end. You will rest, then at the end of days you will rise again to receive the inheritance set aside for you. Do you all know that we... You are living in the last days. Do you know that? I don't know if you do. Do you know that? Your last days. Did you catch me? You are living in your last days. Most of you will probably not live past 100 most of you probably won't live to be 490 years old. Daniel's told, you are living in your last days. You're living in your last days. But there is hope, Daniel. There is a what? An inheritance, a resurrection. Some of you are thinking, what? I don't know. What's next? Did we finally perfect wham? What is it? You have an inheritance. There's a resurrection. This is the first time it's flushed out in the book of Daniel. And so here we see you have a resurrection. You and I are living in our last days. Now here's the deal. I get, I get frustrated when I hear people talk about the last days. Again, they pull out the decoder rings. They try to make sense of these things, and they try to make it say what it probably didn't intentionally mean to say. They try to make the last days into something weird. My aunt, bless her heart, she told me when I was applying for colleges my junior year, she said this, Tony, you don't need to do that. I was like, why? Well, Jesus is coming before then. Oh, okay. I remember arguing with my parents. Well, well auntie says, Tony, apply. You have so little faith. Apply. My mom understood the last days. It could be another 2,000 years. Do you understand that? 2,000 years from now, they could look back and say, wasn't the early church interesting? I want you to think about that. We're living in our last days. I get someone, one of you fools, I don't know who it is, I'm going to find you. I keep getting sent these these. DVDs about these, these people who think they figured out how to decode Scripture. And this guy, Jonathan Kahn, Jonathan Kahn, he's got it figured out, I guess. So I've watched a couple of his videos. It's entertaining. The only truth that I really find in it is his last name. Did you get that? I worked on that one. It frustrates me. But here's the question. 
Because what I see over and over again is God's people, for 2,000 years, we've been predicting when we thought Jesus would come. And over and over again, guess what? We were wrong. Second century A.D., a group said, we got to figure it figured out. Were they right? They were wrong. 1844, a group said, we know. Were they right? No. Here's what this exposes. It exposes we are a group of people who are impatient. We're impatient. We say, God, I want it my way right now. You never hear people giving prophecies like this. Oh, well, 2,000 years from now, Jesus will come. Why not? Because that doesn't sell. Jonathan would make no money on that. We must learn to stop and say, Lord, I need to live now. I need to live presently now. Make this the very best now I can make it because I'm in exile just like you. We need to learn that now. And what's our, what advice can we give you? When we ask God, look, I'm in so much pain. I need you to, I need you to respond. Please respond. I'm in so much pain. What is the response God gives us? Because sometimes he makes us wait, doesn't he? Sometimes we end up waiting. Here's the response that we get right here, chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 23. And now I'm here to tell you what it was. For you are very precious to God. You are loved. When we find that God is not, he's not fitting on our timetable, when God doesn't answer immediately and give you the happy meal, when God doesn't respond immediately and our timetables and our charts don't always work out, don't go back and try to figure it out. Do this. Say, Lord, your ways are so much more above mine. I will trust you, and I'll trust that you're good. I'll trust you when you say I'm precious in your sight. I will trust that you love me unconditionally. And I will rest in that. And my life right now will reflect that. Amen? What do we do? What do we do when our prophecies and our timetables don't fit? We stop being impatient with God and we learn a little bit of patience. Like Daniel. The box are all packed. He comes back and he, has, he starts unpacking them putting them back. And he says, heaven will be here on earth. I will make my years, my last days, the very best possible days I have that reflect God. And if he comes during that time period, what do we say? Oh no, hide me from the light. We say, praise the Lord. Resurrection is here. Amen. I'm going to give you three challenges very quickly as the band starts to play some beautiful music. Three challenges. As a church, we are growing, aren't we? Amen? This room is not going to contain us that much longer. That's exciting news. You want to speed up this a little bit? Because <laughs> we're impatient? No, here's the deal. God is calling us right now as a people to drop our decoder rings and pick up our shovels. Start planting the seeds of his kingdom now. Drop your graphs, your decoder rings. We know Jesus is coming again. The question is, what are you doing in the meantime? Drop your decoder rings, pick up your shovels. Here's this first thing I want to ask you. Would you please invite your neighbors and coworkers into your homes and love them? That's crazy, Pastor. Why would I do that? Because that's what God has called you to do. You want to grow church? Then get to know the people who you're supposed to be inviting in. Why do our revelation seminars and all this stuff not work when we just pass out little flyers? Because the people you're passing out these flyers who don't know you, they have no relationship with you. Get to know your neighbors. Get to know your coworkers. Invite them in your home and learn to pray with them. Love them. Get to know them. Shocking. 
revolutionary. Start doing that. Because here's what we're going to do. We're going to start moving into life groups. We're going to invite our friends into life groups where a bunch of people can love on them and pray over them. And we can dig deep. And after you've invited them to life groups, which means you go to a life group, here's what we'll do. We will do what is most terrifying to us Adventists. We will invite our friends to church, which is terrifying. I was the guy that was terrified because I didn't know when someone walked in, are they going to get accosted because of their shirt that didn't have a necktie? I can guarantee you this. If they step into this service, they will be loved, and they will not hear a thing about dress code or any superfluous stupidity. Amen? We will love them. These are my three challenges to you folks. Get to know your neighbors and your coworkers. Bring them to a small group. Bring them to church. Let's grow as God's kingdom now. Let's stop waiting. Put, put down your stupid decoder rings, your graphs, and start picking up your shovels and planting kingdom seeds now. Stand with us as we sing this last song.